major sponsors for Ableton on Air include Green Mountain Support Services of Vermont, Washington County Mental Health, Ale Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton on Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Welcome to this edition of Able to On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene is not here today, but we would like to thank our sponsors, Green Mountain Support Services and Washington County Mental Health. Um, Green Mountain Support Services, our sponsor of Able to On Air, uh, has a wonderful, wonderful podcast that we would like to everybody to know about and we're putting together clips in a show uh, for you um, and it's called CP Conversations and the host uh, her name is Nicole uh, Nicole Luongo um, and her uh, her email is NicoleLuongo.com that's uh, N-I-C-O-L-E L-U-O-N-G-O dot com uh, and let's take a look at this, um, what the, these wonderful podcasts at CP Conversations. Let's take a look at this. to this episode of CP Conversations with your host, Nicole Luongo. Since we're already in February of 2021, how did that happen? I don't really know. I thought it would be a good time to talk about self-care. And boy, do I have the perfect guest to introduce all of you to. Her, she's my friend, and her name is Kathy O'Connell. Kathy is direct, the Director of Radiant Abilities LLC, which provides resources and products for people with disabilities in the areas of self-esteem, relationships, personal empowerment, and living the life you want. Kathy has a specialized focus in helping people with disabilities with dating and relationship success. She works from the premise of a healthy self-esteem, increased confidence, and good boundaries that build the foundation for success in dating, relationships, and sexuality. Kathy's work in this area also includes providing staff trainings, teaching at Syracuse University's Inclusive U, teaching community classes, creating an online course, and speaking on dating, relationships, and sexuality at conferences. Kathy is a licensed mental health counselor and certified rehabilitation counselor. So please welcome my friend, Kathy. It's so great to speak with you today, Kathy. Thank you. What I wanted to talk to you about today is we're gonna cover a couple of topics. And the first one is how parents can empower their child at any age with a healthy sense of self. And as you know, a healthy sense of self is a huge factor when it comes to loving ourselves and self-love. And for people who don't know you, you have cerebral palsy. So I was interested in learning, A, from your perspective, what is self-love? And B, what was your childhood like having cerebral palsy? And did you have self-love at that time for your disability? Mm -hmm. So to me, self-love is the ability to love, honor, and value all of who you are. And when I say all, I mean both your strengths and your weaknesses. And being able to accept all of it adds to the beautiful package that you are. And for this 
flexibility to be civic, I would say that included in that is the ability to really own your disability as a natural part of who you are and be out in the world as a person with a disability. Yeah, I love that because you're an example of that. You're out in the world. You have a family. You're married. You have a son. You own your own business. And you have your other, you know, you have your other business counseling and, and helping people with disabilities. So you're out there. Were you always like that? I would say so. You, you, the second part of your question is so where did I forget exactly, but where did I learn stuff from? And that was some of my parents. Um, who, when I was born, they had no clue how to raise a child with TV. But luckily, I was the last to their four children. So I, they were just parents and parents. And by the time I came along, and they, their premise was, and I very much adopted that, that I should be able to live how I want to live. And yes, I would have challenges and obstacles along the way, but that should not deter me from the life I wanted to create for myself. And that's what I'm passionate about working with other people. So your parents actually talk to you about your disability? I'm curious because I'm the youngest of 11 and my parents didn't talk to me about it. They had no clue, like you were saying, how to raise you know, a child with a disability. Well, you know, probably one of the most important stories that I take away from how they read to me was I have three older brothers who were um, very much older than me. They were aged 13 to 9 by the time I came along. And when my parents got the diagnosis for me, and went home to tell my brothers, my father simply put it, well, she had cerebral palsy, and that means that she may need a little help along the way. And, and my parents were very simple and very direct. So I think I learned from the example to always acknowledge it, but that it did not take up the whole conversation. Okay. Wow, that's that's really cool. And did ha, as you grew older, did you have some challenges in your life as a result of having CP? Yes. Um, now, one of the biggest and challenges, and again, I'm from a uh, older generation. So when I began school as a kindergartner, it was before inclusive education was legal. So I went to the quote unquote say of a walking school, which was 45 minutes away from my house. Now, the school where all my brothers went was five minutes from my house. And that's the way all my neighborhood friends went. So I'm like, why am I being put on this bus to go 45 minutes one way 
Yeah. Um, the at the CKA, and then I got there, and they um, were teaching me things that I already knew, like how to oh. have time, because my mother was from the get go. She read to me, so I already knew things. Um, so long since the short. I hated it there, and but <clears throat> they, but sometimes my parents were rule followers, and they wanted me to go there. So I began doing what comes very natural to a seven-year-old, and every day when the bus came, I would go and do full out temper tantrum about not wanting to go. Mm. And I did that for six weeks. Wow. And finally, my mother caved in and said, okay, we are finding you a way to go to school with everyone else. Wow. So you, ha you went to that school for two years? Um. Yeah, kindergarten, first grade, <laughs> the very first of our second grade. Wow. Yeah, and that was at a time where it wasn't really second grade. There were older kids clumped in. There were kids who, who did not appear to have any physical disability, but behavioral issues and so do you think that early experience shaped you a little bit it shaped my whole life really because hey even though i was so much seven and i didn't really know what i was doing except following what i wanted it shaped um it like solidified that I always need to listen to myself and make decisions that may go against other people, but know that I trust what I need to do with the best for me. And that's important because, again, we're talking about self-love. You have to love yourself enough to trust yourself. Right. And, you know, I'm guilty of sometimes, oh, what do other people think? You know, they don't like the decision I make, but you're the one living your life, you know, especially when you get to be an adult. Now, it's different for parents, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And, and for parents who are listening, what advice would you give them? Let's say if they have a child with CP or any other disability, say they're seven, like you were. In today's day and age, what do you think they might be struggling with and and some tips of what they can do? I would <laughs> recommend it. And I'm a mother, so I know how hard it can be to really listen to your child because and it was ultimately my mom who listened to me um, and pulled me out of it. School, but um, had, had I not done that, I think something within me would have died. And that sounds very dramatic, but I think that by doing that, it gave me the courage I needed for a whole life of challenges and trying to figure out what was the best for me because as a parent, our ultimate mission is to teach our kids to listen and make decisions on what's the best for them. Do you think that's harder for parents who have children with disabilities? Yeah. Yes, yes, I think it's very hard. 
and my, I saw my dad struggle with that a little more than my mom. Like he did not want me leaving that school because he was scared that I wouldn't get what I needed. And then fast and forward, I'm 16 and I want to drive. And um, he was scared about that, but he was the one taking me out. And, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I think that it's really hard to get to that thing that most people with disabilities are more vulnerable. So, in, in living in life, is it vulnerable enough? And then you mm -hmm. have extra True. layers of vulnerability, which, again, it's why you really need to strengthen <laughs> that inner resolve in your children of listening to themselves. Is there anything that people can do at home? Like, you know how we're all at home now and we, we some people might have more time than they did before because they don't have to go outside of the house for work. You know, if there's ways that people want to practice self-love or a simple exercise that a parent can do with their child, what do you do with your son? <laughs> with my son, I, it's more the moment and where I catch him saying something where he doubts himself and then I give it the, the opportunity. So a teaching, a teaching opportunity. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. But I, but in terms of um, having kids with self um, I would say for kids particularly that it's probably really good to, and, and this is on my mind because I'm reading Judith's Humans Autobiography okay. and in the beginning she talks about being a kid. Can you remind our audience who she is, the trailblazer yeah, that she yeah. is? Um, she, if you've seen Crip Camp, she is in Crip Camp, but she, and I could be wrong about this, but I think, I think I'm right, that she was the former head of Health and Human Services under Bill Clinton. Hmm, I, don't I, know. I could be wrong about that. Um, but anyway, Judy is a great advocate who um, acquired polio at a very young age and grew up in the 1950s using a wheelchair. And at the beginning of her book talks about being a little kid. And they thought, oh my gosh, children with disabilities need to read it to be read it by their parents so that they know they're not alone. And so that they know that saying it gets better really does happen, that you get through the hard times of being a kid and you can grow up to have all these choices and do all these wonderful things. Yeah, that's a great story. Now, didn't didn't she, she was a trailblazer because didn't she participate in like sit-ins to... Yeah, she was in syndrome in the age. No, it gives a bit to even before ADA to um, 1970s that um, I can't think of the proper name of the law, but it helped 
begin the um, to address and the employment that's in grammar nation and be able with the symbolities. Wow. Yep, she's incredible. Yeah. So what, what part of the book, that beginning part of the book, what did it say that really touched you? Um, it was just the, the every day that, that she begins to talk about she grew up in Brooklyn and going down the century to her friend's house, but she couldn't get up the stairs. Yeah. So all she could do was out on the sidewalk, yell, hey, can someone so come out and play? Wow. So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's even though we've come some way, there's still a lot, lot to do as far as accessibility and just, just that one topic alone. Right. But, and, and I know you a little bit, so I could tell people that you're an author of a book. It's a fantastic book. I suggest that they buy it and read it. And in your book, you talk about how you always didn't accept your disability. Is that the right way, you know, that you would <laughs> describe? Right, because... It's, uh, again, I grew up in a different time, so even though I had very supportive, loving parents, um, I was also often the only one throughout mm -hmm. my own childhood with a disability. Me too. So I was always the different one. So I would say, looking back now, that it wasn't so much accepting my disability, but accepting being different and being okay with being different. And so then of it being something looked at or what's more about, you know, mm -hmm. And I often equate it to coming out gay, that you come out with a person with a disability. And Did you ever try to, and I know for you it might be a little harder to do this, but to tr hide that you had a disability? Because oh, you, yeah. you worked, you know, you worked, you were, you, you know, out in, you know, the professional world and all that. I mean, did you ever try to hide it or minimize it? And if so, what did you do? Well, hey, let's think I had slides and the work I did now with dating. But the time that I, the times they were trying to hide it, and I laugh at that now, was so I would go out with my friends when I was in my 20s, go out to bars and I would meet a guy and I'm embarrassed and they'd say that now, but I would like try not to move that much. It would survive in the bar so he can't detect my accent. Um, so those were the times and because dating and relationships was by far the hardest challenge of living with a disability that I encountered. What, what are some of the hurdles that you came across when you started dating? Well, I didn't have the word for it then, but I do have the word for it now. And I call it sexual ableism. And by that, I mean it, it's much like we're dealing with racism. It's a belief in society 
that because of the very presence of your disability, you are then looked as inferior in the realm of dating and relationships. Mm, wow. And we, we don't talk about that. It's a yeah. society. No. I mean, did, did anybody talk to you about it? Like as you started getting older, like your parents or your brothers or maybe a friend, did you talk about, hey, you're, you're getting older, you're a woman, you want to you date. It's a natural thing to want to do. Whether you have a disability or not, doesn't matter, right? Well, um, no, no, no. Welcome to this episode of CP Conversations with your host, Nicole Luongo, brought to you by CerebralPalsyConference.org. Today, I will be talking to my friend, Daryl Perry. Daryl is a brand building certified personal trainer, a habit based nutrition coach, a community manager, and a podcaster who just happens to have cerebral palsy. Daryl believes the most important relationship you'll ever have is the relationship you have with yourself. He uses the fitness and weight loss industries as his playground to show you how to develop genuine confidence and happiness while getting lasting results. For more information, check out yourlevelfitness.com and darylperry.com. And now I get to talk to my good friend, Daryl. What's up, Daryl? It's, uh, it's another, just another day in paradise, Nicole. Just, uh, just staying busy and, and doing the things. How have and you been? I'm it's good. And where is par- paradise for you? So our viewers know where you're. Par- Let's see. Paradise for me right now. Um, we don't have as much snow outside. So I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say down in Florida. That's, that's where <laughs> paradise would be. No, but where do you, where do you live? I live outside of Cincinnati, so just kind of Midwestern. Okay, so so. I'm in Florida now. Did you get some of that snow and all that stuff that's going on? We got like the uh, the outside edge of it. We didn't get a ton, but yes, I remember that you live in Florida, and you know, like that's where I would want to be right now because it's it's a little chilly here right now. Come on, well, you know what? It's funny you say that because it's going to be like in the 40s. Oh, and you guys can't hear. And it's never, it's only like once a year or twice a year. So I, I actually have been in cold weather. I just don't, my body does not react well. I, I just yeah. can't get warm. I just don't like it. So. <laughs> I, well, that I understand. And I know, um, cause my, my in-laws all live down in Florida and I know my brother-in-law who uh, coaches soccer, he says, whenever the, the temperatures get down into the sixties, they, you start seeing people in sweatshirts and drinking hot chocolate. Like they just, they're not acclimated to, uh, to cooler temperatures down there. Exactly. So. I'm in South Florida. Where, 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 what part are they in? He, well, I'll tell you, this used to be up, um, this used to be up by, Tampa. This was in like oh, this okay. uh, Brooksville, but they live now. Uh, I want to say just outside of Jupiter, so probably not. Too okay. Far. Wow, I didn't know that. What a small world, huh? All right. Yeah. So the last time I talked to you was when you had me on your podcast. Thank you very much. A mm. couple of years ago, and I wanted to just catch up with you, and I want to see you're doing so many different things now, and I wanted to just show people what is possible when they have CP or if their child Mm -hmm. has CP. And I know that you are a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. And what I was wondering is how did you land in that field? And was it difficult having CP and trying to go through, because don't you have to go through like certifications and all sorts of stuff? Well, so a couple of things, what what really kind of got me into this, and this is going to, I mean, everybody listening will be able to probably relate to this is I had a really good orthopedic and a really good physical therapist that put me on kind of a, my therapy and we was more or less high exercise. It was a very encouraging supportive environment. This is when I was um, probably 12 and 13 years old. And this just kind of laid the foundation for it. So um, what kind of got me interested in exercise was, was my orthopedic um, now, as far as becoming a trainer, uh, the certifications, de- they're, I, I mean, they're, it, it's, it's basically kind of like your personal training certification, I would say it's kind of like any college level course, maybe a one to 200 level course, where it does take some time if, if you're going through it self 
paste, which is what I did, but it takes like four to six months to get that certification. Um, the hard part, at least when I first broke in um, a, a decade ago is when I was first certified, is that um, you know having the internet kind of like it is right now, you can showcase and build your portfolio ahead of time. You know what it's like being an individual that has CP going into a, a physical building and saying, hey, I'm here to apply for this job. And you're, you're kind of digging yourself out of the hole before you even start talking. So um, I know that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's still a little bit more difficult for those of us that, that have CP or similar, uh, similar disabilities, but like it was, it just seemed much more difficult at the time because you didn't have really online portfolios were just kind of starting back then. What was the most difficult part for you? Was it, was there anything physically that was Difficult in terms um, of getting the certification? So, so as far as getting the certifications, no. Uh, what kept me out of, of really doing my own thing as a trainer was I was terrified to teach people how to do squats because my form is not like, like it's, I basically do everything wrong. So it was kind of this whole mindset of like, or thought process of, okay, well, if I can't do this exercise 100% perfect, how am I going to be able to teach somebody else? But all, all you do, uh, and this is what our, our buddy Sam would tell you as well, is like you just learn how to cue your, your clients through the exercise. And, you know, uh, for anybody that wants to be a fitness professional, because the cool thing is there, there are quite a few of us now. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, like just learn the learn the techniques. You don't necessarily have to be able to do them. Yes, it's nice if you can, but if you can't, you can still be an effective coach and trainer. Um, but that was that was difficult, you know, because some a lot of the moves I have to modify uh, for my own use. So when I'm, yeah. Yeah, so when I'm, yeah. So when I'm teaching others, it's um, you know, it's it's good for program design because like I know all the modifications. But if I'm trying to show them the basic move, uh, it's it's definitely pretty challenging for sure. And when you got started, was that when you used to do classes at the local United Cerebral Palsy where so, you live? So the cool thing, like, so I got the certification back in 2011. I, I wasn't really sure. I was working a desk job at the time. Um, and I was kind of like, I wanted, I always wanted to be certified. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. And then a couple years later, we just happened to have a UCP uh, down the street. Okay. And I went, and I, I got in touch with the program coordinator and I was, you know, I was like, Hey, I'd like to come in and do an exercise class. Now at the time I'm like, well, I'm not a physical therapist. I don't know how any of this works, but you find out that they, I mean, they, they were doing a lot of act of activity and enrichment activities. And that's kind of basically what this was. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, staff would kind of come in there and supervise and then we would have groups, uh, in some cases upwards of like 16 to 20 individuals. And oh. the cool thing is, uh, if you're a fitness instructor, like this was the, the energy that you would feel in this class was amazing. Um, mm -hmm. because see a, a lot of these participants were nonverbal, but they have okay. other ways of communicating. And, and yeah. as a group, as a, as a fitness instructor, you feed off of the energy. Now also as a fitness instructor, one of the best skills that you can have is being able to adapt to the room. A lot of times when people start, they'll have their program written out. This is what we want to go through. This is the routine. If we're going to use music, this is what we're going to use. And you couldn't do that with this, with this group. Like I would come in first couple of times I had something written out. And then after that, it was kind of like, okay, well, we're going to do, we're going to do a flow warm up. but literally how you guys are responding to me in some cases, exercise to exercise is going to determine uh, where we go. So it was, it was always, it was something I wanted to do once I got certified as I, I wanted to do the adaptive programs. Um, and then when I went in and did this group, like it, it was probably, it was the best hands-on experience that, that I had. And I, I enjoyed it. I, I did that for um, about 15 months, even a little bit after the time that I stopped working for that particular company that I was with, that was uh, close by. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a cool experience for sure. You know what I love about that story, Daryl, is that you, literally adapted your coaching style to your audience and yeah. anyone any good coach is going to do that mm -hmm. and for you did that cut like because you were just starting out was it stressful at all to to try to oh my gosh it, because it's, yeah yeah i mean it's you know the the thing is and and, and i mean you know this from any time that you present any time that that 
you know, you do something like the nerves never 100% go away. Um, but the only way that you get better at all is by practicing. But oh, yeah, the entire time, like uh, the first couple when I had these programs written out, I would come in with a clipboard. And I'm like clutching my clipboard because I'm like, what the heck am I supposed to do? But right. um, but no, it was it was great. And I I mean, there were a few of them I, that I that I really, really, um, you know, like it, it was kind of the highlight of, of their week when I would come in. And, oh, and do these yeah. Classes. Oh, and yeah. they made crafts and stuff for me for Christmas. It was so cool. So yeah, yeah that's awesome. the best feeling. I, I used to volunteer with kids, so I know exactly what, you can't beat that feeling at all. And I'm yeah. sure I'm sure that they really bonded with you, not only because, you know, you do have CP and you don't see that now you're saying that we're seeing that more in the fitness industry. And that's wonderful. Yeah. So I just think that that's great that you started out that way. And then like, you, you have like five jobs, what, even what I just read, <laughs> community manager, personal yeah. trainer, you know, podcaster. How do you do balance all these things? And do you have a favorite out of all of those? So I, I'm really fortunate where the work I do, like my job, and that's not even because I, I have a full time job that I do as well. That's that's in marketing and I'm part of a marketing team. We do a lot of the execution for like emails and, and messaging, but we also do some strategy and stuff. And we work uh, with, I'm, I'm with, well, it was Teespring, it's now Spring. We just literally just did a rebrand today. Okay. Um, and, um, but I'm, I'm fortunate because the company that I work with is that they're very encouraging of, you know, when you're, when, when you're, when you're working for them, you're working for them, but when you're off the clock, they want you to pursue all of the other things that you do. Um, so, you know, my job and my, so the stuff that I do during the day prepares me for the stuff I do outside of working hours. The stuff I do outside of working hours is kind of like my chance to, to test and try things. So like when I go in and I'm like, Hey, why don't we, um, cause my job is actually part of my job is trying to teach content creators how to design and then sell their own merchandise. So like things that I try on my own, okay. yeah, is, um, that's, that's actually, where I'll go in and say, okay, why don't we, why don't we suggest doing this? And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate to where everything kind of blends, but it's, it's, um, it's busy for sure. And I live by my calendar. Uh, I have a Calendly link that basically has all my stuff connected. And if, if there's an open time on there and you book a time on it, I will look at my calendar that day and I'll be like, okay, I've got a call with Nicole here in two hours. We're going to be talking for 45 minutes awesome here we go so well you made um, a spot for me so i'm thankful because i know how <laughs> know how busy you are and I'm i just, wanted to to see if you like do, do does anyone ever ask you about getting into the industry and people with disabilities do they want to want to try so, to do that yeah yeah so i mean really i and the cool thing is with all the stuff i do so like with with fitness with podcasting, with marketing, I'm, I, I definitely will, I, I like to, cause I, I've been, to get to this point, I really, really had to hustle and try and, and fall on my face a number of times over the course of about, you know, five to seven years. So anybody that I can talk to that wants to do any of these things, like if I can figure out a way for them to do it in months, what took me years to figure out, I'm, I'm always happy to do it. Um, I, and I actually think anybody that has CP that wants to become a personal trainer, absolutely do it. Because one thing that, that trainers are always trying to do is to uh, set themselves apart. And just by design, I mean, people will pay attention to you when you're working out. If you're somebody interested in fitness and you have CP, yeah. um, you know, you, you've probably experienced this. Now, it's a, there's two sides of it because you're going to get the attention that most trainers are, are really trying to get but by the same token if you're going to end up trying to be an employee at a studio unless you have a really good relationship with somebody already um, you're probably just going to end up honestly being the mascot um, you may or may not get the same opportunities as other trainers so if you're if you're looking at becoming a trainer and getting a job at a gym or a studio you have to have really, really good relationships with your owners and your managers beforehand, uh, because otherwise you can get into something where you you kind of get stuck. I've been fortunate. Um, the studios that I worked with were were very progressive. The owners were very open-minded. Uh, one guy even said, he's like, look, you're here because you have 
you have the disability. Like you're different than the other trainers I have. You bring somebody else, something else here. And then the other, um, and so, and that was, that guy was, he was over in, in the metro area, or close to metro area over in Cincinnati. And then I worked for another studio owner here on, um, on the Kentucky side where I live. And, um, you know, kind of the same thing. Like, you know, she and I just had a really similar philosophy on things. We would talk a lot about, um, you know, like program design and stuff. But I, I do a lot more on the habit-based nutrition stuff, and I am a, a trainer as well. So we kind of had a nice rapport, and it literally was like I, I was talking to her one day. And I was like, you know, I, I think I want to get back into training. And within a couple of weeks, like, you know, I was back there, and I had some clients that, that – uh, some holdover clients that she had, and I had some other people that I was – bringing in so but yeah i I mean it's it's a great uh field for somebody to get into Uh, i just i would recommend thinking of what you're wanting this to be big picture like if you're wanting to just become part of a facility i would build those relationships first if you're wanting to do this where like you are running your own business which is actually what i would recommend um just start thinking of of what is setting you apart besides just having cp um and if you do that especially in, in the landscape we we live in now where, you know, so much of this is on Zoom. I mean, shoot, you, mm-hmm. you really yeah. can create your own life. I mean, it's, it's really pretty cool. So what does set you apart aside from CP as a trainer? Like, are you going to make me, if I train with Daryl Perry, am I going to be doing 9,000 burpees and are you going to scream at me? Like, so, <laughs> so here's where, so th- this is, this is, this is actually, and, and you set that up perfectly. Like, um, you know, I, I, kind of the, the, the stereotype that most trainers go for is like the really, really hardcore workouts and they make you feel it like and the next morning or whatever, or, you know, we, we want to get these results. Like I want to lose X amount of pounds in however many weeks or months or whatever. And for me, um, I, I really, I have a fundamental belief for pretty much everybody that uh, has ever tried to lose weight that is kind of always on or off the diets or on and off these programs is that they're trying to do too much too quickly. And I just have a hunch that if we started with the really basic stuff from a foundational level and did that consistently, that the vast majority of people that have not been able to be consistent and not have been able to get the results that they're looking for um, would be successful. So uh, for me, I'm, I'm the foundations guy now Um, I have the time that when I work with clients, either if I'm doing a a coaching call where we're just kind of talking about goals and execution and how that's going, or if I'm doing a, a what's well now a virtual training session, um, you know, that's my one-on-one time. But what really always kind of irked me about when I was training at the studio and even when I worked at the gym in college, I was just a staff member there, not really a trainer, uh, is like, you would see these trainers, uh, you'd see your clients maybe a couple hours a week. And now... And that was it. I mean, you might like email them every so often and then later you might text them. But like now, if you're somebody that's putting content out on the internet, which you know all about, um, and you're doing like podcasting and you're doing like videos, you can have a steady stream of things to where you're really always with your clients and always with your community. I mean, I'll get somebody, um, you know, one of the coolest things when you are like a trainer and you're known for being in the fitness space, I'll get questions from people like random DMs on Instagram and somebody will be like, well, what do you think about intermittent fasting? So what I'll do is I'll go into my podcast archive and I'll just type, or I'll go to Spotify, type my name and fasting and like three episodes come up and I'll be like, here, listen to this, this, and this. And so then you have uh, somebody that really doesn't even know you except for this one question they asked and you just gave them like 60 to 90 minutes of content that they can just like listen to and hopefully find the answer Mm -hmm. that they're looking for so right um so yeah yeah, it's yeah so but that's that's what sets me different is i'm I'm the foundational guy and when we have a topic i can be i can be with you almost 24 7 in the most non-creepy way possible (laughs) well you bring up an excellent point because the foundation foundation it is important just with anything in life and people Nowadays, especially, they just want a quick fix. And when it comes to losing weight, really with anything in life, there really aren't any quick fixes. Otherwise, if there were quick fixes, we all would have what we want in if in the snap of a finger. Well, and and that, so that's a and 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 this is a question I have for you because I, I think now being patient and like really being able to work through the process of something to me is almost like like it's a desirable skill that most people don't have. I mean. 
you know, we've, you and I have been in the workplace, you know, before this entire internet boom, when things used to work a whole lot differently. I mean, do, do you think like kind of on the scale of, of, um, patience like we've, we've kind of gone the other way where everything is immediate and and like most people aren't patient about anything yes i do i mean actually that's one of the things that sets me apart because i, I don't quit yeah you know most people they try something once they try it twice it's too hard they don't know how to do it they don't they quit and if you're going to achieve anything you you have to have longevity and there's nothing wrong with quitting if you you know sometimes you have a passion or you have an interest in something and you try it and maybe then you realize well i don't like this it's not making me happy or you know whatever you wanted to get from it i'm all for that you know there's valid reasons for quitting but yes we do live in a society especially right now where you know we could just get anything from amazon you know and and (laughs) whatever we want And and i love that but for the purposes of what you do, which which I need you to coach me, you know, building a brand and all that. I mean, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't even know, you know, how I've lasted, but it's because I have a lot of perseverance. It's so two things that 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 you made me think of right there that I that I think are huge, which is one, you know, having CP, most of us have a routine that we have to go through in the morning just to be able to move around. Like, otherwise, we're going to be really stiff, we're going to be really sore, like, just trying to go throughout the day. So, like, we get used to just having to do this mundane thing over and over every day, because if we don't do it, we're we're not going to be as mobile as we would be otherwise. Um, And I think, you know, what I figured out as far as, like, building a brand, you're, you're absolutely right. Like, you just, you stick, you stick with the big picture thing, which is, I have this, I have this 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 name and this idea that I, I really want to build, and you get super clear on what you want your brand to be, and you stick to that. Now, all the stuff that's going to lead you to get to where you think you want to go with that, that stuff you got to be flexible with, and you also have to be flexible with where you th- where it's even going to be where you end up, because like, I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense if so. Like, I start I I incorporated your level of fitness in 2014. I had an idea on what I wanted to do. But like the things that I was trying to do 2017, 2018, a lot of those had nothing to do with what I wanted to do back in 2014. So like, you know, if I was to get upset, which we all do when we first start something because something doesn't work out the way that we think it should, even though we've never done it before, like it just doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you're able to um, just kind of like hang in there and like just test things and figure it out, um, you know, I, I think anybody that's ever found something that's worked for them. Um, there have been, you'll find people that, that have maybe had one or two successes. They've had like a ton of other things that they've tried. Most of them are not abysmal failures. I, I think the only time somebody really truly fails is if they physically are unable for whatever reason to, to get up and do what it is they're trying to do. Otherwise, like you, you really are just kind of learning from something, but you just, you have to be able to separate what, the outside world might think of you versus how you view yourself, which can be really tough. But I mean, I I think the group of folks that you and I are associated with and like kind of what having CP does to you when you're, because you you have to adapt and conquer everything in life. Like, I think it sets you up because like when, by the time you become an adult, you're like, okay, so I can do something. It may not work out the way that I want it to, but like, what's the risk? I mean, I've had people looking at me and, and mm-hmm. making assumptions my entire life. Like, what does this matter if, if this doesn't go right? On the flip side, if something goes really well and you find something that you really enjoy or something that you're really good at, um, or you really develop a passion around stuff, like it's, it's all upside. And, you know, I, I think one thing for me, and this is anybody that's listening, um, you know, we talked about podcasting and I, I had the idea to do a podcast. I was just going to use the anchor app, the little thing on, on your phone where you basically recording voice memos. And like, I got in my head for, um, for, for at least six months and I just didn't do anything. And then I put out one episode. I had this perfect format that I wanted. I'm like, I'm going to do content every day. It's just some quick tips. And then for six weeks in my head, nothing was good enough to do a second episode. And then I was just like, well, you know what? I'm going to do one episode a day for a month. 
and see what happens. And at the time, the app would only record three minute segments at a time and then you'd have to string everything together. So my whole thing was I didn't want to string anything together. So I'm just going to do like a three minute podcast episode, super short. Um, some of them wound up being like closer to five or six, but most of them were pretty short. And um, I got to like day 27 and then I took a break, but I didn't get down on myself because I was like, well, I've gone through this whole thing and I started to get into the habit of, of doing a podcast. That's what I wanted to do. So I took like a day or two off and then I put three episodes out in one day. So I'm like, okay, this taught me what it needed to teach me. And from that point forward with content creation, like I just, I, I basically just, I, I pay attention to my audience and I know kind of like, because, because I'm paying attention and because I'm listening to them, like I have an idea of what kind of messages they're, they're going to relate to, but like, I'm always getting feedback from them. There's things that I think is, would be helpful or hilarious or whatever. And they're kind of like, yeah, no. And there's other things I'm like, eh, I don't know about this, but let's just put it out. And it really resonates with people. So like, I, I think for all of this, it's just really getting comfortable with putting yourself out there and realize like, you know, you're, you're not failing. You're just trying stuff out. Yeah, I love that. I really do. Because even though if when I have an idea or something that I want to do, if you know me a little bit, so you know that nothing really stops me. Mm -hmm. But I did want to start a podcast like four years ago. And I couldn't figure out like some of the software and I got I bought a microphone and I really did try but I was like, you know what, I am not you need to have I really was I was confused for that part. So yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to, cause I didn't have anybody to go to. And then my mother passed away. And so, you know, I put it on the back burner. So I could relate when you say, you know, you had all these ideas and then time went by because make fear or whatever got to, into your mindset. Well, or And podcasting, podcasting is an interesting one because there's so much out there about like, the top 10 pieces of equipment you need and like, here's what you need to get started. And then there's this, there's this little app that's owned by Spotify. That is how I, I mean, anchors, how I record everything. And it's just like you record and you put it out and it's, it's complete. Cause I did that. That was part of the reason I didn't get a podcast started is cause I'm like, okay, I'm going to need this kind of mic. Oh, what the heck is a mixer? Why do I need one? Like, what am <laughs> best food? like what is that gonna be like it, it's so funny because like i'll some people that'll say oh you're a podcaster and i'll say yeah and they'll they'll tell them they'll start talking podcast jargon and i'm like that's not me like well, what kind of podcaster are you and i'll be like well i've put out this many episodes since i <laughs> put out like 1200 episodes since january no, that's so like yeah I mean, congratulations well and see that's but that's when did you start it when did you start it uh, January 4th, 2018. And so what's the, what's the focus of it? So it, it so the, the focus initially was, I'm just going to do short practical fitness related things and motivational things every day. And the idea was off the start was that I wanted people to be able to, um, just kind of passively listen to me again, like they'll be able to hear from me when I'm not around. Um, so that's the, so that, that was kind of the idea from the start. Um, it was originally called the almost daily podcast. And then I, I started doing those. And then I was like, well, what if I want to talk about other things besides fitness and mindset? What if I want to start talking about marketing a little bit? Because, uh, at the time I was, I was doing, um, some marketing consulting because, um, you know, I had a, I, I, so, I, so that stuff was on my mind. Um, and it was funny cause I would go to these networking events and this, this is where it really clicked with me that. You know, because you, whenever you do something at first, you're kind of like, okay, well, you know, what's going to be the barometer of me being a success and like being somebody that actually knows this? And I remember I was at a BNI meeting, and they're like, so what? What makes you think you can talk about podcasts? And I said that I had done so many episodes in X amount of time, and like some people were kind of looked at that like, well, you know, you don't have any production behind it, but other people are like, holy crap, how do you do that? So, I mean, from that, that, that's kind of been my whole thing with podcasting, but I started with those solo episodes and at first I didn't want to do interviews because like, you know how, especially the first time you talk to somebody and if you're not doing it on video, you can't pick up on the cues. And I, I was so afraid that I was going to like interrupt people and talk over them and all that. Um, but like what happened is I, I just told my friend, I was like, Hey, you know, I'd like to try an interview. Like, let's see how it goes. So she and I did one, it went okay. And then, um, 
the second one I did was another friend of mine. And like, as I recorded those, as I was setting things up for that, I I'd, I'd seen something where, um, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk was talking about, like, you got to put yourself out there and you have to like, you know, you just, you have to take, you have to take opportunities, but like your intent has to be, it, it can't always be like, what's in it for me. And I was connected with his, with actually his trainer at the time okay. on Instagram. And he was putting something up like, uh, it's like, hey. Who, I'm, who yeah. is Gary Vaynerchuk for the people listening? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Gary Vaynerchuk, if you're, uh, Gary V is somebody that is a, he, he runs a marketing agency. He's been putting content out on the internet forever. Um, so if you're, if you're into like social media marketing, he's, he's actually a really, really good one to uh, follow. He has a podcast where he puts all these keynotes out. He has some books. His books were actually very influential in me um, switching from what I was in before with sales to like actually finally getting into marketing and, and making some traction with it. But, but I mean, the, the thing was, is like, um, so I, I messaged and I said, Hey, you know, you're, you're doing this Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like, if you want to come onto the podcast and talk about that, that would be awesome. And he's like, he responds back like within 10 minutes. He's like, yeah, man, I'd love to come on. He's like, hey, we can just talk about whatever you want. And wait a second. Stop. Stop. Yeah. Gary Vaynerchuk. No, How not, 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 Gary, <laughs> but, Gary, like, but, but Gary, but his trainer. His so, trainer. Okay. I want to make sure everybody understood. Cause I was like, wait. I'm, I'm sorry. Let's, <laughs> let's clarify there. Um, but, but, but yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. So like, so anyway, so um this guy so jordan Syatt, he was like yeah man he's like i would love to come on and we can just talk about anything but that's and still I awesome so I, but i literally because at this time i'm like well, i don't know about these interviews and i remember i put my phone down i'm like okay this is about to get really serious i better like you know figure out what it is i'm going to do and i i remember again like the nerves don't really go away um but i interviewed him it was it was a it was a nice chat um it was I was nervous pretty much the entire time, but like after that. Well, um, that puts an end, uh, this puts an end to this edition of Able Den On Air. Uh, we would like to um, thank our sponsor, um, Green Mountain Support Services uh, and Washington County Mental Health, but Green, Green Mountain Support Services, especially for uh, letting us show uh, CP Conversations for more information on CP Conversations, um, the podcast, you can uh, go to www.gmssi.org uh, or you can um, learn more of CP Conversations uh, podcast at Cerebral Palsy, that's, that's C-E-R-E-B-R-A-L-P. A-L-S-Y conference.org So that's Cerebral Palsy Conference.org and the host name is Nicole Luongo. And she's an advocate with Cerebral Palsy um, and she helps out Green Mountain Support Services. So for more information on Green Mountain Support Services as well, you can go to www.gmssi.org This puts an end to this edition of Able Then On Air. I am Lauren Seiler. Arlene's not here today, but see you next time. Major sponsors for Able to Run Air include Green Mountain Support Services of Vermont, Washington County Mental Health, Ale Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify.